Good morning. So glad you could all join us for building partnerships to support high quality P3 teacher preparation in California, hosted by the Learning Policy Institute and co-sponsored by the Association of California School Administrators, California Community College Early Childhood Educators, California Com County Superintendents, California Council on Teacher Education, and PEACH, which is an early childhood higher education collaborative. You can find links to all these organizations in the resource padlet. Um, and planning for today's event incorporated feedback we received on our June 30th convening. And Bria is going to add um, the link to that recording in the chat as well. This convening is supported by funding from the Balmer Group, Heising Simons Foundation, David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and the Silver Giving Foundation. Thank you to all our funders. And I just want to acknowledge that yesterday's elections are still on many of our minds. Thank you for uh, being present here with us today. And we hope our awesome program will distract you from the uncertainty that many of us are feeling this morning, even if it's only for a couple of hours. Here's a quick look at our agenda for today. And there's a link to the agenda in the chat for you as well. Uh, Linda Darling Hammond will start us off, and then we'll hear from Lupe Jaime Milham from CDSS, Renee Marshall representing the CTC, and Sarah Neville Morgan from CDE. Next, we'll share the stories of two early childhood teachers. After the break, we'll hear from Brianna Bruns from the California County Superintendent and the Sacramento County E3 team. And we've got a couple of breakout sessions to help you make connections including an optional extended networking and debriefing session facilitated by Rachel Johnson um, after the two hour event. We hope today's event will help you reflect on what it will take to support and expand a well prepared early childhood workforce and will also help you consider an actionable next step based on what we discussed and learned today. And now I'd like to welcome LPI President and CEO and President of the California State Board of Education, Linda Darling-Hammond for introductory remarks. Linda. Thank you, Kathy. It is such a pleasure to be here and to see so many folks who are leaning in on this exciting moment in our California history. As you all know, we've made a historic investment in California and early childhood education over the past two years that will expand access to childcare and preschool for young children somebody could move the slide to the next one. That's great. The early childhood budget has expanded by 51% since the onset of the pandemic. It is the fastest growing component of the budget uh, other than wildfires, according to Assembly Budget Staffer Christian Griffith uh, in his statement at the Water Cooler uh, Conference. The changes include expansion of child care and collective bargaining for the early learning workforce, uh, universal preschool, which will expand access to all four-year-olds and more three-year-olds through TK, the California State Preschool Program, Head Start, and private providers, new expanded learning opportunities with 10 to 1 ratios for young children. Uh, of course, this brings a lot of opportunity and a lot of change. So as uh, early childhood expands, so must the workforce. Uh, teachers are needed throughout the workforce, including lead TK teachers with a teaching credential. Uh, we estimate uh, we'll need 11,900 to 15,600 new TK teachers, depending on the uptake across the state by 2025-26. We'll also need many assistant TK teachers, approximately 16,000 to 20,000 total. We need to fill shortages that already exist in California State Preschool and Head Start, uh, as well as preschool and child care lead and assistant teachers in infant and toddler classrooms. We'll need expanded learning, st lead learning staff to train to training work with young children and with program and administrators with ECE expertise. So there's uh, the whole workforce uh, will be growing. And of course, we want to provide the kind of high quality training that allows them to do their best work with children. Uh, and uh, it's not a zero sum game because opening up TK opportunities will retain many people who would have left the early childhood workforce, uh, upgrading set, uh, salaries in other ECE settings as well over time. So it's all interrelated. Early educators, uh, of course, need a very unique skill set uh, within the learning setting that includes developmentally appropriate, uh, multilingual and multicultural practices, which are a huge emphasis in California. 
they need to be able to use the observation and assessment of children's development and learning to decide how to support them in their growing work. Uh, that we, we need to be able to put in place individualized supports and inclusion-based practices in classrooms and understand the foundations of early literacy and math. And, you know, the um, early childhood educator also needs to be able to engage in family support and partnership uh, and continuous improvement uh, to build their professional knowledge. Recognizing the unique needs of young children, uh, we can turn to the next slide. Uh, California is developing a new teaching credential for preschool to grade three with a focus on these essential competencies. The credential will be another option for TK and grades K through three. In addition to the multiple subject credential, it will not be required in other preschool programs. Uh, getting the credential will require at least a BA, completing an accredited program and completing 600 hours of supervised clinical experience. And it will provide a bridge for early childhood educators with a child development permit uh, and a BA who can apply prior coursework from their teacher permit and hours of teaching toward the credential. There'll also be a kind of bridge from the multiple subject teachers whose 24 hours of early childhood training should apply to the credential as well. Uh, the uh, credential timeline is uh, that we're moving through the regulation process. It's uh, going to be in law as early as 2023. Uh, we'll, the CTC will begin technical assistance for pr prospective program sponsors in November of 2022, uh, which is now, and continuing into next year. The programs may submit pro program proposals for review, uh, but approval can't be granted until the Office of Administrative Law finishes its work. Uh, we hope that preparation programs will be developed for launch in fall of 2023, uh, and we will need early adopter credential programs to offer this credential. Uh, child development permits are also uh, required for other ECE change, uh, teachers, but those have not changed. Um, in, for example, in the California State Preschool Program, teachers must hold or be working toward a teacher permit. There are multiple ways uh, to meet permit requirements at each level. Uh, in terms of pathways into the TK workforce, you can see here uh, that um, there are different ways to get to, into this workforce. The green bubbles show pathways that allow candidates to be employed immediately as teacher of record. Uh, the yellow show pathways in which candidates could serve as an assistant TK teacher while working on their teacher cred teaching credential. Uh, on the left are current credential holders who would need to take 24 units of early childhood coursework to be qualified to teach TK. In the middle are the experienced early educators who have a bachelor's degree, but not yet a credential. They could take a traditional post-baccalaureate teacher preparation program, but many will need to get paid while they're studying. So they might do a teacher residency where the candidate can serve as an assistant TK teacher alongside a mentor while taking coursework or internship programs where an experienced candidate can serve as teacher of record while taking credentialing coursework. And then finally, on the right-hand side, you have experienced early educators or other candidates who don't yet have a BA uh, and we're hoping to see more integrated teacher preparation programs where candidates can earn their credential while getting a BA. Uh, the CTC has funding to allocate for the development of such programs. Pathways to a child development permit or credential uh, will also need to be built into other ECE positions, including uh, pathways to degrees and permits. And these can include dual enrollment in high school. We're about to launch a Golden State Teacher Pathways Program, uh, which will be uh, another career technical education pathway, like those in linked learning pathways that you may be familiar with, that focuses on teaching. And that can, uh, in fact, allow people to take credits while they're in high school towards their early permits. Um, the apprenticeship programs, which are now coming online across the country, uh, which can use state and federal funding to support stipends while people are training to teach. Programs for expanded learning staff who have been in the after school space, for example. Uh, AA and BA cohort programs, which can use funding from the Classified School Employee Teacher Credentialing Program, among other sources. So there are many sources of funding 
uh, through the Golden State Teacher Scholarships, the Classified School Employee Teacher Credentialing Program, and the residency models. Uh, over $600 million are also available for early educator teacher development grants, uh, and UPK planning and implementation grants can be used for all of these pathways. Uh, and then some may uh, end up getting uh, along this path through residencies, as I noted. Uh, we want to maintain the diversity of the early education workforce. Uh, we have a racially, ethnically, culturally, and linguistically diverse group of uh, mostly women uh, who are women of color and uh, nearly half speak a language other than English. Very important for us to build these kind of multilingual, multicultural programs that are going to be pathways of affirmation and support for children. Uh, it's a, uh, an asset to our children and families that we keep at the forefront of our planning for these initiatives. And then uh, in terms of expansion uh, and an equitable expansion, uh, we need multifaceted supports. Uh, those will have to uh, provide clear advising and navigation, uh, cohorts of learners who can rely on each other as well as their instructors progressing together, financial support that minimizes those upfront costs, and I named a number of the sources of that support, and flexible coursework at accessible times and locations. We want to leverage all the expertise that is in this um, conference and beyond. Uh, we're all responsible for building this workforce, the community-based early childhood programs, LEAs and county offices, early childhood child development and teacher preparation programs at community colleges, at CSUs, uh, at UCs and private colleges, state agencies and networks. We will indeed want to partner together to build cohesion around these workforce initiatives and support multiple pathways to a credential. Today, we're gonna to hear from multiple state agencies about the opportunities ahead and how they plan to work together and how we can all benefit from that. And after a break, we'll hear from California County Superintendents and the Sacramento County Office about how they are working across agencies to support the early childhood education workforce. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists, um, a wonderful group of leaders in our state, uh, Lupe Jaime Milham, who is the Deputy Director for the Child Care and Development Division in the California Department of Social Services, Renee Marshall, who is the Administrator in the Professional Services Division of the CCTC, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and Sarah Neville Morgan, who is Deputy Superintendent of Instruction in the California Department of Education. Uh, and so I'm going to invite uh, our panelists, maybe take the slides down so we can see each other and begin this conversation. Welcome, welcome. We're so delighted to have you here uh, to launch this conference. Uh, I'd love to start with each of you from your own vantage point, talking about what is the vision for an equitable early childhood system from your perspective. And I'll ask Renee to start us off. Thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, um, and especially to represent the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I actually am just uh, one month or one day shy of one month at the Commission. I spent the last 15 years in the community college system, but I'm thrilled today to be here to be working on this um, initiative. But when we're talking about this first question in terms of like, how are we going, what's the vision for early childhood education, and how are we going to serve children and families in culturally and linguistically affirming ways, well, it really has to come from an asset-based approach. And that is something that we are all really working on and really talking about even in the terminology that we're using and that we're sharing with the field. Um, we wanna make sure that we're encouraging and supporting the cultural and linguistic practices of the children and the families that are in our schools. We also wanna make sure that we're respecting the home spaces and the cultures that the children and families come from. In addition to that, we also wanna value the experience and the assets that our teachers bring into the classroom. That, that is such an essential piece. And encourage professionals, um, our teacher professionals, to really examine their own perspectives and their own beliefs and really learn how to consider all the various backgrounds and um, cultures that our children are coming from. Most importantly, though, we believe in a system that encourages institutions to embed culturally and linguistically sustaining practices within coursework helping candidates to better understand 
what the best practices are in terms of interacting with parents, interacting with families, interacting with children, and really understanding people from a variety of backgrounds. Um, and lastly, we wanna make sure that teachers have the tools in their bag to make sure they can support every single child that's in their classroom. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Lupe, can you share your vision? Yeah, thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Darwin Hammond, for your opening remarks. And Renee, ditto, 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 makes kind of compresses my talking points a bit more. Um, if I can just add a little bit more in regards to this is uh, one of the pieces that prior to the transition of these child development programs to CDSS that we were looking at is the importance of making sure that we're co-creating and building together. Um, and so therefore really lifting up what we heard during that one year of stakeholder feedback in regards to ask us, we will also tell you and be able to fill in so much of that information. So we know that based on what Dr. Uh, Linda Harmon, um, Darlene Harmon had highlighted, there is a lot going on in the field already, but we also recognize that under CDSS, we need to continue to also be inclusive of the entire mixed delivery system that includes both our family friend and neighbor, as well as our licensed family child care home settings and our non-LEA sites that perhaps are not part of the um, existing pipeline for one reason or another. And thinking about how they're serving three and four-year-olds through these wraparound many times of these programs and ensuring that as we are looking at a cohesive um, approach that those investments that as us being the CCDF lead can also be able to fulfill to ensure that we are making sure that children at um, all different settings have the same type of opportunities and outcomes. Um, thank you. Awesome. And, you know, I can't watch everything in the chat because there's so much good chat going on, but I'm seeing a lot of um, uh, in information about uh, various pipelines for, you know, uh, early childhood educators who are currently working in home settings. Uh, and somebody just pinged that they had a bachelor's and a master's degree. And, you know, that environment is, uh, you know, an important uh, part of the system and also the pipeline. Uh, people who may have bachelor's degrees from other countries who have worked in childcare and early childhood that we also need to be thinking about and including. Uh, so we're going to need a very broad way of considering how to take advantage of the talents and the knowledge base and the expertise that is available. Um, both in our state and, and beyond its borders. Um, Sarah Neville Morgan, can you please share your vision? Sure, and thank you so much. So I'm going to build off what both um, you set up, Linda, and then Renee and Lupe were able to um, build on and bring in sort of the educational spice part of it in that we're in this rare opportunity to really transform California's school system to best support the needs of families today. So all of those investments from community schools, expanded learning opportunities, dual language immersion programs, better supports for students with disabilities, included in that is access to high quality early education through universal pre-kindergarten or UPK. So we, if you see my slide piece, you'll see the UPK background and what we're calling California's Great Start, building off of our master plan for early learning and care. But that vision is that by engaging and supporting educational communities and families across the state, California's Great Start will provide all children high quality, developmentally informed, rigorous, and joyful pre-K to third grade learning opportunities, starting with equitable access to effective universal pre-K thereby supporting enhanced academic height, mm -hmm. health, and life achievements. And so in that, as we move forward with those okay. historic um, transformations around our educational system and implement UPK. Right, everyone would mute. <laughs> we have this bridge created and we actually in a slide deck we just released as part of the UPK piece shows this bridge between our early learning and care over to TK to 12. And so part of that vision really is 
working better as partners and that partnership. So from what Lupe said on the family, friend, and neighbor, and really where are our babies and how do we support our littles? And what about three and four-year-olds who may not be in a pre-K part of a, our system? Making sure that we're still all together with professional learning opportunities, different pipelines and pathways, and making sure investments starting with our babies or prenatal and in pre-K are sustained and actually enhanced so that as you go into that P3 system, you're building off of those assets versus repeating or losing some of those gains that might have been made. So a lot in there, we obviously deeply believe in a culturally and linguistically diverse, both workforce and children in program. So knowing that investments have been made in dual language immersion programs, but always wanting to highlight the bilingualism, multilingualism of California and how in our early childhood world, we, best, we support home language and build into a really deep part of um, English language acquisition, multiple languages. So California continues to lead, lead the way. I think we're the fourth largest world economy. And we wanna keep that and really be part of that strong piece around it. And I think I'll close around um, that need for, for families having clear and authentic choice, but making sure that choice is authentic across UPK and early childhood, which means access to high quality programs in a variety of settings, in a variety of ways across multiple communities to support children on that educational journey. And recent research coming out of Oklahoma and um, through Georgetown's research with them that showed lasting gains and in social emotional. So children attending high quality UPK having lasting social emotional gains and civic engagement. So some sectors may not be as pleased by that, but that means we have more voters because of high quality UPK and whoever thought that would be an outcome. <laughs> Very appropriate uh, to call that to our attention today. Um, I don't know if what I'm about to say is going to be technologically possible, but I see uh, notes in the chat saying that people are trying to um, copy the conversation in the chat. Um, and um, one uh, helpful person has said that you can right click on one of the chats and select all should pop up and then you could do that. Uh, but I know there's a lot of eagerness to see what everybody is saying. There's a huge amount of information being shared, which is exactly what we want this kind of a gathering to allow us to do. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Sarah, to kick off the next question. Uh, can you describe um, the way in which your agency works in supporting the early childhood uh, education workforce? And Sarah, we know that CDE is overseeing the rollout of universal TK and universal pre-K across the state. Um, so can you share a little about how you're supporting the uh, UPK workforce development? Yeah, thanks again, Linda. So um, we're obviously doing this in partnership. So even though CDE has a role, there are bigger roles beyond us. Um, so I really want to say this is not CDE on their own, but obviously with investing through partnerships um, with CTC. So Renee, thank you for your team and um, all the work that happens there, as well as the State Board of Education. So our state superintendent, Tony Thurmond, has been addressing our education workforce pipeline and our needs, especially around a need for teachers of color and male teachers of color since he took office nearly four years ago. So this is a high priority, but I will say a lot of the um, responsibility around the pipeline or higher ed doesn't exist within CDE. So we're more in a partnership role in a lifting up and really supporting people either locally or um, through other agencies to address it. But we do have some authority. So in those spaces, we have worked and launched a U UPK Workforce Accelerated Pathways Constellation. And so some of the things that I saw in the chat around, well, what about I already have this degree or what about um, credit for learning? Those are all pieces that we're really addressing so that as we look at a robust pipeline into early learning programs, we can focus on accelerated pathways for those with child development permits. We also have a lot of workforce investments through the UPK planning and implementation and have 100 million that went specifically for workforce activities to support TK, our California State Preschool Program, or CSPP, and kindergarten teachers. 
and through our partnership with CTC, created a resource guide for UPK implementers called the UPK Teacher Resource Compendium that really looks at a lot of this. And before I pass mine on, I just wanna shout out from our UPK planning and implementation grants, we actually have a little bit of data that's starting to help us understand more. So 61% of LEAs have stated they're offering TK at all of their sites. So creating greater access, but also obviously creating greater need for teachers as you look at all of those TK programs rolling out. And 80% of them said they need additional steps to recruit more educators to TK classrooms, but that their most common step has been partnering with institutes of higher ed to complete the outstanding TK requirements. So lots in that space as we look at that, our county offices of ed, 96% replied in our survey that they are partnering with local institutes of higher ed to offer eligible early childhood education or that coursework. So Linda, while CDE may not have a direct role, I think through some of our funds and our partnerships, we're able to both elevate and provide guidance, support, webinars, all these partnerships, um, including with LPI, to make sure that we can still lean in and help get more of our workforce and a more culturally and linguistically robust workforce. Terrific. Uh, Lupe, um, CDSS oversees several workforce initiatives for birth through school-aged children, including Quality Counts California and the child care licensing processes. How do you see your role in supporting the early learning workforce? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So um, the Child Care and Development Division is the lead administrator for the Federal Child Care and Development Fund, CCDF. Um, with this includes the quality funding that supports the entire continuum of the workforce within the mixed delivery system. Um, so there are several projects that I want to highlight that CDSS is investing that directly impacts the workforce. And you caught out a few of those too, which is the QCC Workforce Pathways Grant, the California Early Childhood Mentor Program, the Child Care Development Training Consortium as part, as part, and these are just a couple. I could probably go on for a while, but just to mention that these are part of the system that supports degrees, attainment, or permit advancement, as well as providing a pipeline for professional development and coaching too. Um, and so it well contributes to the goal of retention and recruitment of the workforce. Um, during the pandemics, the family and children experienced significant loss. And um, it, it just was, it has been such difficult times during these past couple of years. Um, and so we heard from the um, workforce how important it was to have investments around um, infant and family mental health. That is core. And so as part of that core work, then we had some targeted investments that we enhanced out of our quality dollars and had some additional pandemic funds, uh, 10.6 million um, for infant early and childhood mental health consultation that the network and it provided a couple pieces. One is targeting new, new individuals that can come out. So building that workforce that can come out and support our workforce um, that are providing both culturally and linguistically development care, but also um, informing to through trauma-informed practices. And then the last piece I would wanna add also was that through the um, pandemic, we also have um, had numerous conversations with the child care provider United CCPU. And as part of that, um, we have a 40 million training fund um, that was as part of that agreement um, through those conversations. And the training fund specifically really supports um, inclusion training, equity, language access, apprenticeship, and a portal to support the sharing of resources. So as you notice with just this brief menu, there's a little bit of every for everyone, where we the whole goal is that everyone can see themselves in these investments, which are really centered around supporting our workforce. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lupe. And Renee, um, the CTC oversees the both child development permits and the new ECE credential, and then the multiple subjects credential with the extra 24 units, which are all the pathways into the various parts of this uh, system. So can you give us an update on uh, the work as it relates to early childhood credentials? Yes. 
Absolutely. And I'm excited that we have a lot coming up. As everybody knows, the commission, our responsibility is to make sure that every child is taught by a highly qualified teacher. That includes program standards, certification pro process, um, regulations. Everybody knows all the bits and pieces that goes into it. It's, it can be quite complicated, but it's also really exciting. Um, as we know, the PK3 credential was voted in September, excuse me, in October at the commission meeting. TPEs and standards have been developed. Now we're waiting for regulations um, to go through, which we anticipate in early 2023. I'm excited to say that we have an introduction webinar coming up. Um, I believe it's just next week. Oh my goodness, it's like one week from today at 11 <laughs> o'clock. So everybody save the date, save the time. If you haven't um, seen the announcement either in the PSD news or the ECE news, um, shoot me an email. I'm happy to help get you connected. Um, and if you aren't signed up for those, uh, the PSD news or the ECE news, please um, highly suggest getting signed up with those. But Linda, one of the pieces that I think is so essential right now um, that I feel like is a huge part of our role and responsibility is to listen to the expertise in the field. You know, we have research coming out showing that on average, our ECE professionals have 15 plus years of experience. We know that it's a highly skilled group of people that we get the opportunity to work with. And so, and I love to talk. Everybody who knows me knows I love to talk. And guess what? It's my turn to listen. And I cannot wait. I'm going on listening tours. I'm trying to get into as many spaces as people will allow me to. Um, just yesterday, I had the opportunity to be face to face at the Ventura County Office of Education. And just what? Oh, also CDE. Everybody, just so you know, it was so exciting to be in a space with all these leaders in early care education. And then at the end, seeing all this collaboration and just beautiful expertise, just um, you know, just being able to just soak it all in. And then at the end of the meeting, they literally shared every single announcement from Department of Education that you could ever imagine. And just seeing that collaboration and that, um, you know, coming together, Linda, like that's a part, a huge part of this. And so um, there's all sorts of places that people can be in, like um, included if they want to. Like right now, there's a field test that's happening for the teacher level permit. We have 17 colleges that are already signed up. Um, 14 of those are community colleges, two are, pri are one's private institution, and two are LEAs. I'd love to see a, a much more diverse group. And um, that work doesn't start right away. So hopefully more people will jump in. In addition to that, the design team is meeting soon. I mean, there's just, there's so many pieces that if anyone's interested, I shouldn't say if anybody's interested, I know you're interested in being involved because you're here today. I want to guarantee to everybody CTC, we are here to work together as this rollout happens. This is not going to be two or three days. This is going to be years of all of us coming and working together to make sure we do what's right for the early childhood workforce, which we know is already highly qualified. And we just need to see who's interested in going on these different pathways, but also most importantly, for the child, uh, for California's children. Thank you, Linda. And I think we lost Linda um, right at the end there, um, but I wanna just thank you um, so much, um, Lupe, Renee, and Sarah for providing that framing and context um, around supporting the early childhood teacher workforce um, and for um, reminding us that your three agencies um, are constantly communicating and working together. Um, and so we thank you for, uh, for engaging together in that work. Um, so we're now going to hear from two early childhood teachers who are at different points in their preparation tra trajectories, um, who are going to share a little bit about themselves and some of the barriers and challenges they've had along the way. Um, first, we'll hear from Linda Jackson, who is a state preschool teacher in Central Unified, and then we'll hear from Karen Sanchez, who is a paraeducator working in a TK classroom in San Diego Unified. Hi, my name is Linda Jackson. I work for Central Unified um, as a preschool teacher. I have been at my site uh, for over 16 years. I currently hold a site supervisor permit. Last winter, I decided to go back to school because I wanted to transition from T uh, preschool to TK. And so I signed up at National University 
Um, I took three classes over the summer and due to health uh, reasons, I had to put it on hold. I then was advised by one of the counselors at National University to take a class at City College. Um, that way it's not as fast as national and it would be less stressful for me. So um, next year, um, in the uh, next year, I will be starting a special ed class, which I feel that will really benefit for me since I work um, in a preschool classroom. Um, it was very hard for me to decide to go back to school because there was a lot of um, things that I had to really think about how I was going to, um, uh, how I was going to, to have time to study, um, the cost of my books. Um, also, it was I was thinking about that when I started the credential pro program that I might have to move to a different school um, so I can put in my hours. Um, and like I said, last year before I started thinking about going back to school, I um, started looking around for support, like family support that can help me with my own children. I have two children that are, um, are um, elementary age and I needed to also have time to spend with them. So I asked my family um, for help. Um, I also um, rented my books. I rented my books through Amazon. That way they would be a little cheaper for me. Um, that was a little hard because I wasn't able to take my notes um, or you know write in my books. So that was a little hard, but I was able to uh, return the books back in good condition. Um, then I, like I said, I asked my family for help. Um, so that way I had time to study and I can have time to um, be with my children as well. Hi, my name is Karen Sanchez. I am working in a transitional kindergarten classroom in San Diego Unified. I've been doing this for just six weeks. And before that, I was a paraeducator for eight years who had considered becoming a teacher, but was really just overwhelmed even by the thought because um, I didn't know how I'd pay for it. I didn't, I had a lot of self-doubt. I didn't know if I could really follow through beginning to end. And also I didn't know how to navigate and just even where to begin. Um, but recently through this partnership with the University of Laverne and San Diego Unified, I joined the University of Laverne's Early Childhood Education program working towards an ECE permit and it is fully funded which is incredible it is allowing me to do the schooling online and then implement basically what I'm learning right away it's all happening at the same time which I think is so valuable and um, there's a roadmap that's been laid out for me so that I can easily see where I'm at, where I'm going and how I'm going to get there. And that's just really one of the main things that gave me the confidence to know that I can do this and that um, I'm going to have this guidance throughout the way, throughout the whole way, which is just so important to me. And it's really what's keeping me enthused and motivated and um, confident. I wish more programs like this were made available to people that are interested in becoming educators. I feel it would make all the difference because it is, it is hard. It is hard for many reasons. Everybody has their own personal reasons. Um, but when there's a, an employer or a university that's backing you and giving you all these supports, it is easier to see yourself at that finish line and easier to think of yourself as that teacher. So I, my hope is that more people are able to take advantage of programs like this and that more teachers come out of it. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm just really grateful and excited and I can't wait to, to complete my program and maybe take it further from there. We'll see. So inspiring. Um, I was really inspired uh, when I talked with um, both Linda and Karen. Um, but 
the barriers and challenges that they named um, are limiting the opportunities to enter and move along the teacher prep pipeline for many, many potential candidates. Um, and other higher education faculty, students, teachers, district leaders that we've spoken with echo a lot of what Linda and Karen just talked about. So we'd like to just pause and provide some space for reflecting on what could your organization do to help address some of these barriers and which barrier and try to be like real specific in your reflection. Um, so we'll go into breakouts. Uh, the breakout will be very quick. You're going to be put into random groups of four or five and you'll have about six minutes. So do, do some brief intros, um, name an organization and then discuss your reflections on what your organization could do to help address some of these barriers. And we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Of policy and advocacy for the California County Superintendents. Brianna? Hi, thank you so much for, for having me today. Uh, I'll be giving a very brief uh, uh, presentation on some promising practices that, uh, that are going on at the county office level. If you, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I love this slide. I think it's a really uh, helpful GM reminder. Uh, CDE has put out the following UPK guiding principles specifically for county offices. And I think it's a really great reminder for the conversation today. So uh, first and foremost, in all things that we are doing as we're implementing UPK, there should be a focus on equity, focus on uh, our littlest learners who we're supporting. Uh, second, we should be approaching UPK planning and implementation with a learning mindset. So being open-minded, having conversations like we're having today, bringing folks together is incredibly important, uh, which leads right into the, the third guiding principle here to connect partners and implementers to make sure that we are creating a very coherent and um, comprehensive system for our littlest learners. Uh, fourth, we should approach UPK planning and implementation um, as an informer and capacity builder at all levels. So again, this is a great, uh, great example of that in practice. Uh, and five, respect and leverage the knowledge and expertise of early learning and care and expanded learning communities. So I'm really excited that, that we have this event today. We're bringing together experts uh, to help to support UPK implementation. Next slide, please. So this is an example of what a career lattice could look like in the early learning space. There should be an, there should be an emphasis and opportunities for folks to enter in uh, to the system in multiple places and also move through the career lattice um, with, with ease. So this is um, just one example uh, of the different steps that could be included in a career la lattice at any, given, um, at any given county. Next slide, please. So this is an example um, from Santa Clara County Office of Education. So thank you to them for, for providing this example. Um, but essentially, this is this is uh, what can how you can create a pipeline within your own county. So first and foremost, is a need uh, the you need to assess what the need is in your county. Um, so all of the the details and mechanics that that go into that assessment. Uh, second would be to map the assets of the county. So what currently exists and then what are the gaps that you will need to, to fill in as you're filling out what the pipeline should look like. Uh, third, finding partnerships. As we know, especially in the UPK space, partners are incredibly important, um, especially as we're, we're moving into this mixed delivery system where we have different partners who are experts at different things. Partnerships are incredibly important. Fourth, again, identifying gaps. So what, where do the gaps exist? And then five, planning. So how do you plan to, uh, to implement a system that, that best supports the, the specific needs of your own community? Next slide, please. So again, this comes from um, Santa Clara County Office of Education, and it's what their what their plan looks like, what their collaborative looks like within their county. So this will look very different um, from from region to region, um, but essentially, you have the County Office of Education partnering with LEAs, higher education institutions, and other early learning providers and organizations in order to create a comprehensive system uh, that best fits the needs of your specific community and your community's needs. And that's it for my presentation. Um, I've included my, my contact information in this slide, but I would love to, uh, to uh, the opportunity to introduce Julie Montali and the team with Sacramento County Office of Education, who'll be giving um, some more examples of promising practices. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. We are really excited to be here. Um, as the executive director for our uh, 
lead agency for the SAC E3, and that's the Sacramento Consortium for Empowering Early Educators. It's really my pleasure to be here and to be joined by some. You're going to see it's quite actually a large group, but it's still only some of our partners in our collective goal to build a diverse and highly qualified group of educators across the full early learning continuum. And that's through our um, the grant funding that you are all aware of, I'm sure, the EETD, the Early Educator Teacher Development Grant. We're also um, really fortunate in Sacramento to be building upon a, a really rich history of collaboration here. Partnerships and relationships are, are just really key to making this comprehensive pipeline work. And you're gonna see that each organization brings really a special aspect and area of expertise and truly a willingness to both enhance existing structures as well as create new approaches. And particularly when it comes to recruitment practices, I want to kind of pause for a second on that and say, I mean for recruiting of all early learning educator roles. One segment we all know is supporting really developmental PK programs and the qualifications that are needed, but we're really committed to a larger goal, and that's to continue and really increase the ECE workforce across all avenues by offering financial supports, career navigation supports, uh, coursework, um, help through permits and degrees and training opportunities opportunities, and that includes our leaders, our school leaders um, through our Early Learning um, Principals Academy and, and district leaders. Um, that we can't forget about those, those folks. I'm excited to share the Zoom stage today with representatives from Charters, Community College District, our four-year university here, uh, Sacramento State. We've got one of our two School of Educations with us. We also have one of our larger private providers and in addition, a leader for expanded learning in Sacramento, and of course, a regular close partner on many fronts, our resource and referral agency here in Sacramento. So you're gonna have an opportunity to hear just a little bit from each of these perspectives. And I'm so happy to welcome Joy Takoy from Gateway Charters to kick us off. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I agree with you, it's been really nice to participate today. I enjoy all the conversation and the suggestions in the chat. Thank you, everyone. So I'm representing Gateway Community Charters, which manages five LEAs offering multilingual TK and early admittance TK programs in Sacramento and Yolo counties. And we're thrilled that Dr. Montali envisioned a collaboration between a wide range of providers and included charter schools. She understands that it will take all of us coming together to give families the options and choices they need and deserve. And this is very much in line with the work of charter schools. But as we can tell from the chat, bringing together such a broad group often presents challenges of competing interests and sometimes uncertainty. Uh, but Dr. Montali did an excellent job mitigating that by centering our group around the common UPK vision, um, as already mentioned by Mrs. Neville Morgan, that we are to provide joyful early childhood experiences to all children. And that is a common goal that we can all agree on. Uh, she also made site visits um, to determine the needs of programs, to determine the needs of staff, of students, and to make personal connections with those with whom she wanted to partner. The SAC E3 Consortium for Teacher Professional Development has already been very helpful for us in reviewing teacher transcripts determining which of those courses are applicable uh, for the ECE or child development course requirement. And the SAC E3 um, recognizes a need to backfill staffing gaps as the workforce shifts a bit. And in doing so is supporting all program options and the individual teachers and the paraeducators. And Gateway Charters is thankful and happy to participate in the SAC E3 consortium. Thank you, Joy. And yes, everybody, I, I pay her well to say those things. Um, <laughs> so Joy, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, you re represent a really important group. And next I wanna talk a little, or uh, have Lori Perry from our Los Rios Community College District talk a little bit about um, a couple of things, but Joy, you brought up the um, assistance with the transcript review. And so thank you to Lori for just jumping right in with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, take it away, Lori. Thank you, Julie. Um, I represent the Los Rios Community College District in this collaboration. 
And the Los Rios Community College District is the second largest community college district in the state, only after LA. So there's a large number of students in all of our different early childhood education programs at both Sacramento City College, American River, Cosumnes, and Fulton College. We're excited to partner with um, SAC E3 because we see it as an opportunity for our students to move through any through the field, through the career lattice into professional level jobs. And so I think that's going to be really important for them. And we feel we can support them by having, first of all, the ability for them to take classes across this huge, large district at any college, um, and then the career navigator. And a career navigator will be someone who they know they can go to who will point them in the right direction. Now, we have wonderful websites. We have a district-wide website. We have almost much information out about the community colleges. So what we're going to try and do is have a career navigator who can help them pinpoint their needs and then point them in the right direction. Not necessarily do it for them, but empower them to find the information that they need. And then I'm always happy to help students. I've been helping them get permits through the Child Development Training Consortium for many years. And so reading transcripts, seeing what classes people need to take advance. First, maybe associate permit, then a teacher permit, and then transfer. I want them to know they can go all the way. And I really appreciate the support that I think this grant will give them. So many thanks in that area. Thank you so much, Lori. And Lori mentions the fact that this is a, a comprehensive pathway to really be able to have people on ramp and off ramp as they need to and as they would like to. And we want that to be um, accessible and the opportunities to be there so they can pick and choose what um, area of early learning of the early learning continuum they'd like to, um, you know, either tread on for a while, maybe change to a different, um, maybe not. So um, part of that pathway then is to actually have the opportunity, if they would like, to uh, to go on to um, part of our partnership with Sacramento State. So we have Dr. Ana Garcia Navarez here to talk a little bit about some um, building on some existing structures. And we're so exa uh, excited to have you with us, Anna. Thank you, Julie. Happy to be here. Um, just like Julie said, I represent Sacramento State University. I'm a faculty member and also the program coordinator for the cohort and blended program um, that I'm gonna be talking about. And part of this program, which is the child and adolescent development is to offer our cohort and blended uh, program to the ECE workforce. Um, students earn their bachelor's of arts degree offered uh, tuition assistance uh, with this collaboration with SAC E3. And just to share about uh, the structure of this program, the Child uh, Development Bachelor's of Arts degree is based on a learning community model. So we place students in cohorts with a combination of video and web-based delivery. This is coupled with the local face-to-face -face cohort discussion and facilitation. The web-based instruction modules are taught by our faculty and are designed and implemented to support and extend the video stream content delivery. So the on-campus instructor um, delivers the, the lectures video stream. And then we have a cohort facilitator who views the content with the students at their local site. The video stream content is then discussed with the cohort facilitators. Um, and this model allows for students to interact and discuss course content at their satellite location. We started this uh, program 15 years ago, um, and it was due primarily because of the teacher shortage in early childhood education. And the purpose was to increase the workforce um, in helping students earn their bachelor's degree. And now we're faced with the same shortage. So now, now this program again is being revived. Um, so ECE providers uh, were challenged at that time uh, with completing their bachelor's degree. So because of the limited access uh, to a university, uh, course scheduling, and either social or psychological barriers. So the blended approach uh, for students um, who may not benefit from a fully online program uh, with the opportunity for a traditional face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and the online instruction. This is a three-year program. 
students take two courses per semester, and this includes summer. So the majority of our students are working adults um, who are not able to attend a university on campus or the traditional schedule that universities offer. And the program structure offers the following, the location of where the students live and work, that's where they're, they meet uh, to take their classes. The courses um, that they take are offered in the evenings. And the class sizes are usually roughly between 20 to 25 uh, per uh, cohort. And the students are together with their cohort uh, facilitators for the three years. So this builds a sense of community and support each other along the process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for, for sharing a, a great model that, again, we want to build on those existing structures that we have, as well as create new. Um, and part of the, um, the, the, the wonderful partnership with Sacramento State is that we are able to support um, students, candidates with uh, a, a fair amount of tuition assistance through the EETD grant money. And we know that, of course, uh, financial uh, barriers can be what really holds folks back. And, and we want to remove as many of those barriers as we can. So financial barriers, as well as those more human supports, that career navigation that Lori mentioned. And um, so, so thank you for to both of our IHEs for um, being with us today. Now, I do want to turn um, to the schools of education. We are so blessed to have two schools of education that work with us on this grant. One is housed here with me at our County Office of Education. Um, and then the um, the intern program that will be uh, partially funding tuition for is in that program. We have here today with us Dr. Margaret Fortune from the Fortune School of Education. Um, again, so blessed to have her and her team as partners in the SAC E3 consortium. Um, she has a very unique way of uh, providing an intern program, in particular with this ECE focus. So um, Dr. Fortune, take it away. Julie, thanks so much. We're excited to be a part of the SAC E3 consortium. And uh, Fortune School of Education is a part of a regional initiative in partnership with the Sacramento County Office of Education to close the African-American achievement gap by getting kids ready for college now starting in preschool. So through this partnership, um, you know, we also uh, credential uh, teachers and administrators for 60 school systems um, largely in Sacramento and the Bay Area, but also throughout the uh, California. And we're accredited by the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing um, to offer district intern programs. Um, so what this particular partnership um, has allowed us to do is to start a Reggio-inspired lab school that will be a part of um, how teachers earning their multiple subject credentials get their early childhood experience. They'll have their classroom experience at Fortune Preschool, uh, which will open up in Elk Grove uh, in um, January. And so this partnership is helping to fund those activities, but also helping, helping with tuition assistance for teachers who will earn their credentials um, through uh, this, this program uh, in partnership um, with the SAC E3. Um, we're really excited that most of the preschoolers that these teachers uh, will be teaching are African American. Um, uh, they will also um, um, uh, most likely be low income students um, who are eligible for the subsidy subsidies through our resource and referral agency. So for those in this space that are interested in the equity work, um, these teachers are going to have that experience um, front and center with our youngest learners in a model the, that is Reggio inspired that um, oftentimes uh, uh, kids of color don't get to have access to, but really centers on the child and their abilities. So we're exci so excited uh, to be starting this partnership and to provide this setting for our early childhood educators to be, um, uh, to get their professional development uh, and for our K-12 classroom teachers in the region to have the opportunity to earn their credentials um, as the state puts its focus 
on early childhood education. Thank you, Dr. Fortune. We're so excited to be uh, kind of on this journey with, with and alongside you. Um, and I look forward to the opening of the preschool lab school. Um, that's just really a, a phenomenal piece. Um, so thank you so much. So next we want to kind of sort of turn our attention to a few other partners that um, represent various agencies and groups that support many aspects of the workforce development, including the re recruitment aspects. And working with these folks, I have found that we're, they're really great for creating um, access and opportunities for targeted audiences. And some of those are audiences that we haven't typically or traditionally really invested in, in looking at. And so we are doing that now. Um, and we encourage really everyone to kind of think about the tried and true, but then also think about outreach strategies um, to build the early educator workforce in some new and different ways. Um, so first we have mm -hmm. Shayla Williams Barnes from Catalyst Kids. And um, Shayla, what, what great stuff can you tell us today? Hi everyone, my name is Shayla. I am with Catalyst Kids. We uh, operate over 160 sites up and down California. We uh, care for infants, toddlers, all the way up until school age. Um, and so our, our offerings uh, specifically for teachers is that uh, like Julie mentioned, we're probably often the forgot about uh, grouping. Um, we highlight mostly before and after school programs, specifically uh, in my cluster of Sacramento area, we have teachers right now who we're getting um, at the assistant level with not a lot of experience and maybe a little bit of schooling. And so we use that opportunity to kind of build on that, um, that foundation of those green teachers. Uh, we've been able to work and collaborate with uh, Dr. Montali and making sure that grants are provided to teachers who uh, want to continue to do schooling. And that has been super helpful in our field. Um, as an agency, we really hone in on those teachers who are coming into us as green as they are, because as we all know, staffing has been an issue in our field lately. And so we're just really trying to focus on making sure they want to see this, uh, see this industry through with us and through uh, the ages of our children. And so in many cases, uh, we pair our assistant teachers up with uh, maybe mentor teachers who've been around a long time and can offer that in addition to in-classroom experience but also those things that are kind of outside of the box you may not learn from a textbook um, that has been super helpful to us. Um, in addition, our, our cluster with Dr. Montali has been uh, just really helpful in, in allowing us to collaborate with community partners who we normally wouldn't collaborate with as much. Um, I think Joy touched on it early on. Um, our industry can be slightly competitive, but being able to come together as a county and decide, you know what, we, we our focus is families, children, and subsequently, um, obviously, our teachers, too, and supporting them. And so she's created quite a, a great space for us to kind of bounce ideas off of one another and build partnerships that we probably wouldn't have had before. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Montali. That has been super helpful. Um, yeah, so I, I think our building of our partnerships has been um, probably the biggest strength that we could offer from this and any advice that we would give is just like Dr. Montali said, kind of think outside of the box of who your core stakeholders would be and, and think of the others, too. Thank you, Shayla. Um, and sort of just, we're going to have Mark Drews um, piggyback a little bit on um, on this recruitment aspect. Um, Mark oversees our, he's our director of expanded learning here at the County Office of Education. And Mark and I started having conversations um, last year and he became part of our UPK team. Um, and so we've had a chance to really work closely on a number of things. So Mark, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing your perspective. No, thank you, Dr. Montali. Uh, so my name is Mark Drews, regional lead for region three expanded learning programs here in Sacramento County. Uh, we roughly have 336 expanded learning programs in Sacramento and the nine surrounding counties that we provide technical assistance and support to. Um, and we're currently growing uh, in our expanded learning ecosystem in Region 3. We're practicing and growing our expanded learning opportunities programs, which are welcoming on TK and K youth for the first time ever. Uh, and roughly by uh, July 1st, 2023, we'll be welcoming TK youth onto 143 elementary sites if we're just looking at Sacramento County alone. And so what can we do to help prepare that workforce as they welcome in this new demographic? 
So that's why we, we are excited with this collaboration with SACI 3 Consortium and our early learning partners to help build and grow the capacity of our expanded learning, early learning workforce. Uh, we're especially targeting the expanded learning opportunity practitioners uh, because they're diverse and they speak multiple languages. Uh, and, and we're helping to build their capacity and advance them up the workforce ladder if that's a pathway they so choose. Um, and many of them have gone on to careers in education, but it's taken them longer because of certain barriers uh, that existed that we saw in the chat. Uh, economics, maybe not even knowing the pathways that are available to them. Um, so just this is a great opportunity for us to highlight those pathways, those opportunities, and that's what we're doing in the SAC E3 consortium. Uh, recently, we partnered with Dr. Montali, uh, Stacy Sewell uh, out of the Sca Sacramento County Office of Education Early Learning Department to go ahead and help build, start that foundational piece of building competencies and development, developmentally informed practices for our expanded learning workforce as they slowly welcome on a TK uh, students into their programs for the first time. Um, so just wanna highlight that, you know, if you are in the state of California and you haven't reached out to your uh, expanded learning regional lead team, I highly encourage you to do so. We can't do this work alone. We need help of all partners to build and diversify the workforce. Uh, and just wanna leave you with this fact, we'll, we'll put in the chat the link to the contacts if you're not familiar with who your contacts are and expanded learning in your particular area. But roughly on average, each academic year, there are over 800 to 1200 uh, clinical experience hours that exist in expanded learning that we could help develop and grow that workforce. So I just wanna thank Dr. Montali for inviting us and welcoming us into the SAC E3 Consortium. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, you know, Mark and I have talked a lot about how we um, have this, this incredible group um, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's around 760 or 80, some, some odd staff members across the county. And what a great group to tap into um, in terms of workforce recruitment. They've basically already stepped into it saying, you know, maybe education is is my, uh, my future. Um, certainly they're present. And so working with Mark has really truly been a, a delight. So thank you so much. So our last panel member is Anthony Garcia from Child Action Incorporated, which is our resource and referral agency. Um, we partner on many things and this is just but one of them, um, but such an important um, group uh, in terms of, of working in the mixed delivery space. And again, recruitment, for the workforce and pockets where we may not have had um, as great a connection. So thank you, Anthony, for joining us today. Sure, thank you, Dr. Montali. Thank you uh, to the other panelists from SACI3. I really appreciate the opportunity to say a little bit about what we're doing here locally. Um, I am from Child Action. I represent um, the Alternative Payment Program and the Resource and Referral Program here our agency um, known as Child Action. On the alternative payment program side, we support roughly about 5,000 families at any given point that fluctuates a bit. That represents about maybe 92 to 9,400 children, often coming from our most challenged communities in Sacramento County. Um, on the resource and referral side, we're charged with um, connecting with all licensed providers in Sacramento County. Currently that count is somewhere around 1,800, about 485 licensed, licensed center programs. This would include both public and private. And then the difference maker is a family child care side, which can hover somewhere around 1,300 to 1,350. So that's quite a large pool of providers that we work with. In addition to that, we work with the family, friend, and neighbor communities that are both hooked up to our alternative payment program as a provider receiving a subsidy for an eligible family or those family, friend, and neighbors that are interested in continuing or deepening their own professional development because they recognize they're caring for children, especially very young children, and can use some support um, in that space. As a participant in SAC E3, we think it's very important for us to continue to assume a space that recognizes both the opportunity that the resource and referral program, like a child care initiative project, which is, um, building the capacity in family child care to support families, um, recruit, train, retain family child care providers 
um, often we're working with monolingual providers to use that as an opportunity for a pipeline if those interested in that space want to pursue a career into this space that we're talking about, the U UPK, UTK world. Um, but also to remember there are a number of providers in that space that won't choose to move in that path. And if they don't choose that path, what are we offering to those providers in the way of support? We hear, we hear the mentions of it in the public conversations or the conversations in that public space of pay parity, pay equity, how do we support professional development, career development, permit development, um, school units? How do we, so the, the bigger question for us as a resource and referral agency in that space is how do we do exactly that for this private community of providers who has chosen not to pursue that career path, but whose support for young children is just as important. And often the young children that they're supporting are coming from those marginalized communities those communities that are monolingual communities. So how do we continue to recognize that and create those pause spaces in the conversation to recognize this challenge and try to develop something that might be a parallel process to support that space. In addition to that, as we think about the family, friend and neighbor providers, they're even maybe a bit farther separated or they have a bit more of a gap in connecting to a formalized system of providing care, even though they're providing care to families often. And what we heard earlier in one of the speakers that was talking about their story on how they were trying to attain the um, educational units and get into uh, the college space was she had to rely on a family, friend and neighbor to give her the time to get through the coursework and the classes. That is always gonna be a true story for anyone who has children that is going to work or going to school. And if they're using these other providers, if they're using family, friend and neighbor providers, how do we, like with family child care providers, consider to continue to offer support to this population of the early learning workforce so that they are recognized for their commitment to young children and not just in, in words or commentary, but also in that idea of parity in pay, equity, professional development opportunities. And I think one of the more important parts of our participation in SAC E3 as we continue to develop out these programs is to bring the stories of what we have learned over the years in running different professional development programs, going back to AB212, the um, staff retention uh, workforce development that, uh, program that used to be in existence, uh, and a few num a number of others um, going back a little bit farther but to bring the stories of where the challenge came up and to think about why, how we might be making promises or carving out a pathway for somebody who may not be able to get there. And more specifically, if you just think in terms of an Arabic or Farsi speaking family child care provider who's encouraged to participate and go down this career path, where will their struggles be real? How much of the education that's offered through community college or the state school is offered in Farsi or Arabic? What would be the expectation around their English competency to continue along that path? And if that becomes too much of a challenge, how do we continue to celebrate them and provide them with the support while they can continue to serve the children and families that we work with? So we're excited to continue in the conversations and see how this can develop even more in Sacramento County. Thank you, Dr. Matali. Anthony, you, uh, you bring up so many incredible points and everyone, hopefully you can see that this is why it's so important to bring different voices to the table, um, which is not always easy, right? And sometimes there are things that are not easy to, um, to grapple with. And I appreciate you very much, Anthony, for um, being that, that voice that we, we all need to hear. Um, so we hope that you take away that it's uh, kind of like we hear, you know, it, it, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, clearly it takes a vi village to raise a comprehensive early educator pipeline with various ways to on-ramp and off-ramp 
for uh, an individual's you know, selected career path, whatever that might be. Building on existing structures, you know, take a look, do, do a, an inventory of what, what's out there, bring the folks together, um, and then expand on um, ideas so that uh, different people can really come, come together. Our collective advice is start the conversation. Be okay with surfacing these kinds of challenges that aren't really easy, um, but they are important and they are there. And so rather than deny it, let's, let's you know, uh, let's put our heads together. Let's identify these, these issues, these challenges, and what are the potential solutions um, that we can come up with? I think for me, and, and hopefully I speak for our team, is that uh, appreciating and honoring what each of us bring to the table is, is so important. Clearly, not one person, not one entity can can do all of this. Um, I, you know, my my career experience has really been from the LEA side. So I really, um, I think it's very important for us to say, okay, so yes, the the what a TK looks like on a school campus being incredibly developed. Uh, developmentally appropriate and how do we address that with leaders who are so impactful in that space. I'm looking at some of the pieces um, that were put into the chat and I wholeheartedly agree with those of you who talked about that. So one way that we're trying to work on that is through our Early Learning Academy. Uh, right now I've got 40 um, site school and um, and district leaders with me learning about play-based instruction. But that's only one segment, right? There's so many other um, partners that bring a different type of expertise. And I'm so grateful to each and every one of them. Um, I hope this has been helpful to those of you who are trying to figure out how to start. Um, and really the, the honest to God's truth is in a nutshell, just start. So thank you so much for having the Sacramento uh, Consortium SAC E3 with you today. Thank you so much, Julie and Sacramento County E3. Um, what an awesome example of coordinated regional collaboration. Um, your, your organization might already be part of a regional group like this or partnering with uh, one other organization, or maybe you're just starting to think about more partners. Um, but we're gonna give you a little bit of time right now to network with others from your region. Um, like I said, you may already be working together um, and you can use this time to get some work done, um, or you might be making some new connections. Um, when Nicole opens the breakout rooms, you will self-select one of the rooms based on your region. Um, some regions, not all of them, some of them will have multiple rooms and that's because we wanna keep the rooms to about 15 or fewer people. So if you notice, for example, you're in region 11 and you'll choose from four different groups, um, 11A, B, C, and D, and just try to distribute yourselves evenly across the group. So if you notice one of the groups has a bunch of people and another group only has a few people, you might wanna join the smaller group. We'll have a little bit over 20 minutes in the breakouts and each room should have an assigned facilitator. Facilitators, you should also self-select into your assigned breakout room at this time. If you're in a room with no facilitator, please chat me or the host and we'll help get a facilitator in there with you. Um, so when Nicole opens the rooms, you'll see a breakout room button pop up on the Zoom toolbar at the You're muted, Kathy. You're muted, Kathy. Sorry. Um, when you click it, the list of rooms should pop up and you should just click on the join button to the right of the name of the room that you want to join. Okay, so go ahead and click on that. For me, it's the more button with the three dots. Um, you're gonna click on breakout rooms. And there's a list of breakout rooms there. You're just gonna scroll down and find a room based on your region and click join. All right, I see people going into their rooms and we'll see you on the other side. A special thank you to our presenters, our panelists and facilitators and all the people behind the scenes who helped make this event happen. A big shout out to our event manager, Nicole Wilbon and Bria Henderson, who's been helping behind the scenes today with the chat and all of the 
tech issues. Thank you again for bearing with us as we uh, experienced a few tech snafus, but um, I hope that you were um, able to learn something today and that you met a new person and that you were able to make some connections today. So thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day.